How are failures just platforms to your success? Stay tuned and find out. Okay, here's the question. How are we dark horses? You know, the ones everyone is betting against, the ones they don't expect to win, place, or even show on the track, and they'll even laugh on us when we talk about trying. How do we show the world our greatness and triumph? Well, that's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. This is The Dark Horse Entrepreneur. My name is Tracy Brinkman. What is up, what is up, what is up, my Dark Horse friends and family? Welcome back to your weekly dose of artificial intelligence learning. I'm your Dark Horse host, Tracy Brinkman, and you? Well, as you already know, that question is infinitely more important. You are or a driven entrepreneur, or business owner, or hoping to be one very soon. Either way, you're here because you're ready to start, restart, kickstart, or just start leveling up with some great marketing, personal, or business tips and results in order to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. And that's why I'm here bringing you yet another big episode, because today, David Selinger, he's going to share a wealth of information on why you should eat what you kill, why you should get back to your roots, the benefits of merging ideas old and new with the current trends, integrating the into the prospects, life, and needs, and why your failures are truly your platforms to success. Plus, I want to get you a little teaser in here for next week's interviewed episode guest, who's a best-selling author, speaker, Iraqi war veteran, and badass biker chick. Yeah, you heard that right. As per usual, the Dark Horse Corrals are chock full of personal business and marketing G-O-L-D spilling from every corner of the Dark Horse Entrepreneur HQ. So let's get to the starting gates and go. Alrighty, my Dark Horse friends and family, tonight's guest is David Selinger. Now, David was an early employee at Amazon working directly under Jeff Bezos. He led the R&D arm of Amazon's data mining and personalization team. He's co-founded Redfin, which is now a multi-billion dollar company. He founded Rich Relevance, a company that offers personalized shopping experiences for large brands that includes Macy's, Barney's in New York, Office Depot, and the list goes on. Uh, now he's inventing the next big thing, Deep Sentinel. Now I'm not going to share any of the goodness. I'm going to let Dave share all that. So David, welcome to the Dark Horse Entrepreneur, brother. Thank you very much, Tracy. Great to be here. I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to reach out to your audience. It sounds like there are folks that are very close to me in terms of the spirit and, and, and way they view the world. So I think this would be a great, great shot. I think you're absolutely right there. Definitely. Uh, we have a handful of serial entrepreneurs that uh, lend us their ear, but lots and lots of solo. And I call them indiepreneurs. They're out there just doing their own thing, which you clearly are. For those that can't see, it may not be watching the video part of this. Uh, my man's got this awesome little Star Wars collection behind him. So we were, we were, we were doing some note taking about Kiss versus star wars uh, <laughs> the vote is still out <laughs> well but, you know uh, I mean, it, it's a wh- whether you're at the top of a you know an organization and and you're an entrepreneur in that sense or you're doing something on your own i think the that the mentality is really similar and that you see something that needs to be done better differently smarter yeah. faster more customer centric and and you do it and you to use the term that I learned in sales. You eat your own dog food every mm-hmm. day, all day long. You eat what you kill, and that's it. And and there's something about that ability to combine a skill and sales, and to do those two things together means that you understand. In the context of technology, you have to understand technology so much better because you have to understand it not just what does it do, but why does it matter. To mm-hmm. these- why would they ever want to buy something from you? Right. And how and how can they leverage it? You've got to know that for them quite often because sometimes I think uh, to, to spin off what you were saying there, they can't put the gears of the cog together. They can see the cog and say, oh, yeah, that's cool. That's amazing. So what? Exactly. But then, you, then you start educating them saying, well, if you did this with it, guess what would happen? And then their, their gears start rolling. And that's where I think those entrepreneurial mindsets really step in. But like I was telling you, I want you to tell your story, good, bad, ugly, ups, downs, rights, lefts, that brought you to where you are. And then obviously that's going to lead right into Deep Sentinel that we've kind of teased a little bit here. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I'll give kind of the two minute version of my, my background. Okay. I grew up in Southern Oregon. 
in uh, in Josephine County. Grew up in a little town called Merlin, which is a suburb of Grants Pass, Oregon. Uh, Grants Pass is known mostly for its river. It has a beautiful river called the Rogue River that goes through it. And I grew up being an outdoors and river kid. Uh, we used to go rafting, whitewater rafting every Thursday, which is my dad's day off, and then on the weekends. And that really defined my childhood. Uh, we would go swimming during the week. My mom would take us to go feed the ducks as little kids. Like everything was about this beautiful river that we had flowing through there. Um, in fact, if, you, if you're interested in, and you want to learn about another kind of cool entrepreneur there, one of the families in that town started uh, a jet boats to go up and down the river. And it's one of the most amazing experiences. All my friends that go through Oregon, I always tell them to stop in Grants Pass and go on Hellgate Jet Boats. And, and that's owned by a family friend of ours that he, they started you know, from, from very meager beginnings and, and grew that as well. Um, it's an entrepreneurial town too. And that a company that was started there just went public recently. Mm -hmm. It was a company called Dutch bros in Grants Pass, uh, which is a coffee company. They just went public on the stock exchange. I want to say like six months ago. And I was involved there early. Um, but uh, so, so I went to high school there. I then applied to colleges. I got to go to Stanford, um, on the ugly side. I, I applied, there's two kind of bad parts of that. I applied my first choice was Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, and I did not get in there. My aunt was uh, an alumnus and I still didn't get in. Oh, man. Um, uh, even did her, I think, I think her graduate work there as well. My mom went to Harvard. I didn't get into Harvard. Um, and But I did get into Stanford. I ended up going there and that was awesome. Uh, the other bad news about Stanford, and I just talked to my parents about this last week, actually. I got a full ride at all the other schools I applied to. So I got either didn't get in like MIT and Harvard. Or I got a full ride, all four years, fully paid for tuition, books, room, board, everything. Or I got nothing. And so I chose the one school where I got nothing, which was yeah, Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my folks were awesome in letting me do that. That was, you know, if you, every single person has privileges. And, and, and I think it's it's not important to shun them. And it's not important to, to beat up somebody who hasn't. But it's always important to be appreciative of them. And I did have mm -hmm. that option. I had the option to go in my parents' room sometime in April, uh, in 1996 and, and go in there and say, Hey mom, dad, I decided I'm going to go to Stanford and they didn't say no. And that was really the foundation of the rest of my career. Went to Stanford, studied computer science with a focus in robotics and artificial intelligence, did a bunch of graduate research there in all kinds of areas, um, under former secretary of state, uh, Bill Perry, I did security and technology research. I did robotics research and haptics and force feedback. I then went to Amazon, where I ran the R&D division, as you mentioned, started Redfin at the Knights at Amazon. That was an amazing uh, opportunity. I started that because I just saw an opportunity to do real estate better. Mm -hmm. I then started a company called Rich Relevance, like you mentioned, which was the uh, kind of the manifestation of let's take everything I worked on at Amazon and let's programmatize it, make it available to lots of other retailers, some of which you mentioned there. Uh, and that became a global company, grew it to like $45 million in revenue, um, at which point I, I realized that my job was sales. I was flying around the world doing sales and mm. I was okay at it and I was good at it and I didn't like it that much. So I really wanted to get back to my roots of technology and really understand that. And so I left that company and I started this one where I actually built the entire first two versions of the software. And I got to be very hands-on. I was in my garage building it. And, and uh, it was an amazing experience. What Deep Sentinel is at a high level is we take security cameras and we turn them from recording devices that you can post on Nextdoor and Facebook and say, look at this guy stealing my package. Look, I caught him on video. Congratulations. After the fact. <laughs> After the fact. Right? Like, yeah. Cool. Do you want a shirt? Like, you want a cookie? I'll give you a cookie. Um Where's your stuff, right? Where's your car? Where's your catalytic converter? Well, you know, where's your, where's all the stuff that they stole out of your car? Where's your car? And, um, and I realized that the real problem and opportunity was there were two vectors changing at the same time. One was technology where AI was getting really, really good. I mean, in the 25 years I've been studying AI, we right now are in the middle of a revolution, like in an absolute unconditional technology revolution. I can talk about that. If, if you want to just go into that for the rest of the talk. <laughs> we can do that, that big. Um, and then at the same time, crime was changing. People were not breaking into houses as much anymore. 
In fact, burglaries are down year over year for like two decades. Mm-hmm. And but what they are doing is they're stealing stuff off your porch, out of your RV parking lot, out of, and they're um, vandalizing your business, and they're stealing stuff off of your driveway. And that type of crime is on a massive uptick. In, set, in fact, it's the exact opposite. Package thefts are so high that the FBI has totally given up tracking. Like it doesn't even have a wow. statistic that it can, you know, can consistently say this is what the number is. That's crazy. And so I was able to combine AI with cameras and turn it into a, a crime stopping superhero. And, uh, you know, maybe that's a, a little super uh, uh, overstatement, but uh, but in some senses, it's not. I wake up every morning to videos of my system and my guards and our, our technology stopping crimes, stopping burglaries, stopping assaults, stop, stopping uh, trespass and vandalism and package theft. In fact, I think one of the cool things we've done because our, our system combines AI and guards. So the AI detects suspicious behavior and then the guards intervene and, you know, mm-hmm. hey, this is deep sentinel security. Put that package down, get away from there. That combination also means that we can interface really well with police. So when we call police, I say, hey, I've got a, a white medium aged male, five foot eight, stealing a package at this address. The police can do something about that. They have a description of the suspect, a description of the crime, and a description of their location, and it's real time. So we have like the only arrest for package theft in progress. At the same time, if there's an assault, hey, I have a woman being assaulted at this address. Again, you know, this description of a suspect, it's a Hispanic male, is, you know, in his older ages, and he's about six feet tall. Police can respond to that, and they can do so in a way that's safe for everyone. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, accomplishment. I love Deep Sentinel. It feels like the culmination of everything that I've done all together. Um, but like I said, I'm happy to kind of go into any of those different directions. Yeah, I, I was uh, I, I was actually super excited about this conversation after, especially after um, I went and looked at the Deep Sentinel website. And I was poking around. I was like, oh, now I get it. Because you know, I was reading through what what uh, what they sent me, and I was like, okay, that sounds cool. But when you go and you look at it and you see it kind of in action, you kind of like, have to uh, see it, don't you? Yeah, right? you kind of have to see it doing its thing. It's like taking standard, I don't want to name any, I'll just say one, like one of those okay. ADT kind of companies who react, the alarm gets set off. Probably not if they are stealing stuff off your off your porch, right? But the alarm gets set off if they do try to break into your house and they may send the police there. Yep. And to your point, it's kind of after the fact. By the time anyone gets there, the stuff's gone. Um, but your your AI, and I, there's probably where we're going to dig in here. That AI is saying, "Oh, that's just someone walking by. We don't have to worry about that." Oh, this is someone suspicious, or the activity right. is suspicious, that's and right. that alerts your your people, your sentinels. And by the way, don't saying superhero is perfect because when I was watching the 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 promo video on there i was thinking of the x-men the sentinels that were that were a part of that uh, uh, that franchise but anyway so sentinels and superheroes is a good one but, but now you have live people looking at it confirming what's going on and then they can take the appropriate action whatever that may be yeah i mean you you nailed it right you, you almost have to see it to believe it right i mean like when, when, when you hear somebody saying that like oh i could do that with my ring i could do that with my nest or whatever like no, right. No. Like that's why all the videos you see on Facebook and on Nextdoor and all over the internet are of people stealing stuff. They right. are not of str- crimes getting stopped. And I remember one of the moments for me that really opened my eyes was in LA, there was this guy and he had a doorbell cam. I think it was a ring. And he posted this video of this guy licking his doorbell for two hours. Oh my gosh. <laughs> just, 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 it, could you describe an ineffective security system more extremely by saying, here I have this video. Not only is he doing something that I find untoward and uncomfortable, but it doesn't stop. Right. These systems are not designed to stop. And you mentioned ADT. You know, one of the things a lot of Americans don't realize is that 95 to 99% of calls from alarm companies are false alarms. Mm. 95 to 9, and those aren't my numbers, by the way. Those are numbers that were developed by Freakonomics. And if you're, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you don't know Freakonomics, go do that right now. Like, yeah, yeah, go look at us. Go, go take care of Freakonomics, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, they went and studied this and they realized, oh my God, this is a complete waste of taxpayer money. Mm-hmm. We are sending police to 95 to 99% false alarms when there's real crimes going on. And yeah. 
scaring the, the police are going, you know, in a, in a state of alarm. We are potentially putting homeowners and business owners at risk because the alarm has gone off. And right. if there's not a crime in the homeowners there, you now have officers with drawn weapons mm-hmm. a- attacking the homeowner. Right. And there are numerous cases where homeowners have been arrested, placed in handcuffs at gunpoint because of their home security system. Right. And that really made me realize, holy smokes, we need to do something better. Like we need real safety. And, and, and our mantra here is that obviously we're a technology company, but our mission is that we, we're really mission-driven. We believe that everybody should feel safe, period. And that that has massive changes, not just to your personal psychology, but to, to everything. And, and again, to your point, like it, you got to see it. My recommendation, if you want to know more about Deep Sentinel, go to our website, go to our YouTube channel if you want. Mm-hmm. We have videos we produce every single week with us just stopping crimes. Go out there and check it out. And, and I'm happy to, you know, kind of go into that, go more about Deep Sentinel, but I'm also happy to just talk about entrepreneurship a little bit. I will say, though, as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur to entrepreneur here, what I find the most invigorating about this project, this company that I started, is that it combines my skills and my technology and my sales, whatever, and all my experience with something I'm really passionate about. And, and, and that was a message that I came here thinking about. I'm going to get an opportunity to talk to a bunch of entrepreneurs out there. Mm -hmm. What would be the one thing I'd want them to hear that I think is really important, which is that that this one came from my heart. It's not just a personal experience. It came from the things that matter the most to me in the world who are my family and my, my passions, the things that if you made me retire tomorrow, what would I go and do? Cause I'm gonna have to do something. I'm gonna wake up at some point. I got to go do right. something. Right. I'm going to go work on AI. Cause I love it. Like, in fact, when I left my last company, I actually retired for a, about two years and my wife came down to the garage at two o'clock in the morning, five days later and said, honey, you can come to bed anytime now. And I have a shop and like a whole, whole robotic slab in my garage. And I wasn't like, I was, I was not coming home. I, or coming right. to bed. I was <laughs> Italy. I was, that was, in fact, this right here, for those people that are watching, is what I was one of the things I was building at that point. This is a, uh, a an at scale model of BB-8 yeah. that I just I saw the the preview for BB-8 and I was like, I need one of those. So I went and built it with my daughter. So I, again, though, as an entrepreneur, like what what I find really neat about this is that it combines those two passions for for meaning and for technology at the same time. And you know, and that's one of the magic. I think the magic formula is that so many. Uh, mentors tell you, right? I mean, whether it's you, or the Grant Cardones, the Neil Patels, all the names that are out there saying, do mm-hmm. something you care about, preferably that you love. Um, but but then you have to pause and say, well, what if you love licking drywall or licking ring doorbells, right? Yeah, or licking. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a whole lot of opportunity to make some cash doing that. You might, might maybe for a short time. Maybe a YouTube but, video t- station on that, right? I that's mean. right. Maybe there's some opportunity. <laughs> hey, great doorbell licking techniques, one on one. But uh, but you're but, gonna find some some Yahoo is listening to this, and we are gonna have gonna the doorbell oh licking God. channel on YouTube. Just because send a royalty right check to David Sillinger. At, uh, <laughs> 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 no, but certainly being able to do something that you have a passion for right? It is just, it's going to keep you up at night. You, like you were saying, you were up oh, two in the morning, you know, futzing around with your AI stuff because it's just something you love to do. So if you can imbue that into your, uh, into your entrepreneurial endeavor, then man, it's, it's going to get you over those, hum- those humps that will happen, not might happen. We, there's going to be a wall that you got to smash through and that passion will certainly drive you through it. it fair statement. Oh my gosh. So, so much. So in fact, as you were saying that it made me think about, yeah, you know, passion really helps me do better on good days, but the day there's a specific one I could think about with deep, deep Sentinel, which was in March of 2020. Mm -hmm. And, And it helps you get over those really, really hard days that nobody could have predicted. Right. And, and, and you can predict that something's going to happen. Like you just said, it's not, if it's, it's when, when, you don't know what it's going to be, and you certainly don't know how hard it is going to be. And you, and, and the other thing, maybe you don't know is that is this the last one, or is there an even harder one around right around on the corner? And if this is enough to get you to stop, then how are you ever going to get around that next one that's five times bigger around the mm-hmm. corner, and you don't even know what it is? 
And, and, you know, for us, like I said, it was, it was in March of 2020. We, we, as a family had realized that COVID was going to take off and do something, but I, you know, I pulled my wife aside and said, let's take our kids out of school and let's, let's prepare for six to 12 weeks, maybe six months. Okay. I had no idea. I had right. no idea what this was going to do to us. And I was one of the early people that was like ringing the alarm bell saying, these are the stats that I'm seeing in China. I have my office in China. They are freaking out. You may not be seeing this, but here's what I want you to see. Sure. And, um, and so I thought I was really well prepared, but I wasn't. I mean, I, I, I was caught fully off guard in terms of the degree to which it impacted the financial environment, impacted our business, impacted right. our supply chain, impacted our team and our culture. It's, it's changed everything about everyone in every business is, is the way that I would kind of 100%. You know, 2022 cannot be the year where we use the word unprecedented. And I'm done with that word, though. We, <laughs> we just say that it changed everything, though, right? And you know, I think in a lot of ways it, for, for the better, right. In that I believe that more people know what matters to them now than did two years ago. Yeah. More people are in tune with what they will do and what they will not do and what drives them and makes them happy. So many people have changed their careers doing COVID said, you know, what? I'm sick of working in a big company. I'm going to go work at a small company because mm -hmm. I want my voice to be heard. And especially when I'm sitting in, in this chair, for 12 hours a day on Zoom calls, I want to make sure that people are going to listen to me. Right. I want to make sure. A lot of people said, I don't want to work at a small company. I don't want to sit in this chair and be on Zoom calls where I'm afraid for the stability of the company. I want to go to a big company. You know, just the amount of like fundamental career shifts that realign human beings with the things that matter to them. I think actually in, in 20 years, when we look back on this pandemic, I think we will realize that more of that happened than we deserved. Um, and I, and I'm hopeful that that will overcome all the other like crazy stuff. that came right. out of it. Yeah. All the nutsy things that did happen out of it. Uh, and I think that's one of the, uh, we'll put that on there as one of the good things that's come out of the past couple of years is the opportunity for so many people to say, well, I've got a couple of weeks off here. Oh, it ends up being a couple of months. Oh, it ends up being, you know, a couple <laughs> of years. Um, yeah. What do I want to do with my life? And they, you know, just took a minute to, to view it. I think another cool thing, I'll go on this rabbit hole for just a minute. Yeah. Another cool thing is I think a number of people have opened their eyes to the complacency that they have had as a voter or as a, as a community participant or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. um, I've been seeing, I actually uh, was working the polls here uh, April 5th on voting day for the springs, spring uh, elections. And uh, I knew the numbers of voters for our small little town was probably, it was just under 3,000. So I just quoted you how small of a burg I live in. I, um, I was doing the math there real quick, like. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and just over, I want to say 15, 1,600 people showed up to vote. And it's, not a, and it's not a big major election, right? We're talking really school good. boards and uh, we have a, a judge running. And uh, which I thought, okay. That's really good because the ladies that uh, had worked 83%. the previous cycle said just over 700 people showed up at the major, the last major election. And I'm like, wow. So I think another one of the good things, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on or what your opinions mm -hmm. are. It has opened your eyes to, I need to be a little more involved in what's going on in my community and maybe even further up. Uh, as a result of what we've seen happen the past couple of years. So that's another good thing that's come out of that. I think so too. I mean, it, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, the, th this is not America. And there's a, there's a, there's a really kind of black and white view of our politics that I think has to exist. But if you go back and you look at the history of America, America's history is not one of agreement and coming together to even like, you know, one of the big things we herald was, United States joined World War II and we, you know, we won the war and we were so powerful and so important and so aligned. We were so not aligned, <laughs> right? I mean, if you actually look at the polls, you know, two weeks before we joined on the side of the allies, it wasn't 90-10 allies versus Axis, right? Like mm -mm. we had a really, really huge chunk of our population that was saying we need to join World War II, but in support of Germany. Yeah. And, uh, how conveniently and, and, they forgot that, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but and, and now we've come, I mean, this is the typical kind of rewriting of history based on who yep. won, right? Um, what I think is actually much more interesting, though, is to look at the degree of, of challenge that we've always faced. And then, you know, Hamilton came out right at the beginning 
of, uh, a, 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 I think this was 2016, it was right at the beginning of Trump's uh, uh, term in office. And it was a reminder that, that we have never been a country of complete agreement. In fact, the whole idea of Jefferson and Hamilton was one of complete anathematic disagreement. Yeah. yeah. And, and we consider them to be, you know, we refer to our founding fathers and their ideas. They didn't have an idea. They had wildly differing ideas and, and, and debate that wasn't always respectful. Frequently mm. it was disrespectful. But that somehow that process of grinding and, 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 and rubbing the grit and the rough against each other, yeah. whether, whether you're on the left side of America or the right side of America has resulted in what I believe objectively and, and, and uh, you know, I hope most people would agree is, is still the best country to live in in the world. We don't have the best health care. We don't have the best education. We don't necessarily have the best political system. But even when you bring it all together. When my wife and I, in this last couple of years, asked ourselves, is there somewhere else we would want to live? The answer wasn't maybe. It was a resounding no. This mm -hmm. is an amazing country made up of all those passions. So, sorry, you, you, you. No, that's, you those, are, those, are, those are all I'll great points. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a third generation military man. So I'm all about uh, the red, white, and blue and, you know, and tooting the horn of the Americas. But let's be honest, we, we, we have black eyes and we've got blemishes and <laughs> yeah. we've got a couple of teeth missing and, you know, it's not all roses, but I think to your point in the big scheme of things, if you look around and say, yeah, I don't want to live anywhere else. And here's here's really one well, of the cool things that my wife and I have had this discussion a few times. You know, we could, if we wanted to, go to another country and visit this place and visit that place. Of course, maybe not now, but we, <laughs> right. I'm but we're like, back. <laughs> right, I'm looking. Back. But as, as we traveled the United States, one of the things we love to do is like go to rock festivals, and you just you know you go over here and you see all these bands and you go to you can see just about every culture type here in the United States, yep. right? You want to go see China, you can go to any one of the Chinatowns uh, on the East Coast or on the <laughs> West Coast. You want to see some India, you want to see some Germany. Uh, I live a whole bunch, a whole bunch of Germany up here, up here in the Northern Midwest. It, of course, it's, it's a lot different than going to a different country, but I think there's so much to see right here that there people is. forget. They're like, oh, I'm going to go to Bali. Okay, it's beautiful. I get it, right? But what about, you know, the Grand Canyon? And what about, you know, all these places that are amazing here within our-, like our I mentioned our, music. I mean, I, I, there's certainly kind of the, the superficial part of the culture. And, and, and I think Chinatown has some of the superficial and the deep. Sure. But when you talk about things like music, right, mm. I don't think you can avoid but get into the depths and the meaning of a culture. And music is, I'm a, I'm a tech geek, so my appreciation for music is probably pretty superficial relative to people that really, really love music. Um, but I have come to appreciate the arts and music as capturing an element of the heart mm. that you cannot capture with anything mathematical or, or, or equation-based that it has such deep meaning. My wife and I are, are complete 180 opposites. She's all heart and I'm all, all brain. And I've, I have a little tiny heart and, and, and she's, she actually has a, a very big brain, but she has a massive heart. Like she's, she's the nicest person I've ever met. Makes you a good and yin and yang then. It, it is. It's awesome. And it, as long as we're not fighting, if we're fighting, it's not so good. But, um, but what I, what I've learned about these cultures and, and, you know, you, you mentioned is that if you, if you reach into music all throughout America, music and the arts, if you go to, an African art festival, an African music festival from Somalia or from Ghana. And, and you really listen to that and you engage in that, the dancing. And, and uh, Cynthia and I, one of the things we used to do when we were dating was we lived in Oakland and we would go to, and Oakland has all of these different uh, cultures. They have all different music fests and art fests. And that was by far and away our favorite thing to do. During the pandemic, we got ourselves an RV, uh, a little fiver, not a little fiber, so almost 40 foot fiber, so 35 foot fiber, um, and uh, and traveled around California and, and, and some of the surrounding states. And to your point, though, we had gone all these other places. We I've taken the kids to Taiwan. They've been right. to Australia and New Zealand. And you're now listening to the Dark Horse Entrepreneur Podcast. Oh my gosh, I think I think my kids have been to like nine countries actually, and right. and we hadn't explored 
uh, Yosemite. We still haven't actually. We hadn't been to, to, to Lake Tahoe. We hadn't been to Donner Lake. We hadn't been to Lake Shasta. We hadn't been salmon fishing together. And holy moly, there's so much fulfillment in that. I mean, we're, we're way off of uh, entrepreneurship. No, here, that, that, but I think that we were in. Uh, I think we can actually we could loop that back in and say, you know, because you you were mentioning earlier when it comes to entrepreneurship. And one of the things uh, I think you've probably done throughout your career is solve a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the solutions or the problems are right in your backyard. They're not in Taiwan. They're not in all these other unique and exotic places, man. They're they're right on your front doorstep. They're right on your back deck. And you just got to put a little elbow grease into it and start cranking it away. Uh, for you, uh, AI, it's a huge passion, right? Oh. Uh, let's go. Uh, I, I saw something and I haven't read it fully yet. I just kind of skimmed through it. And it was called... AI for entrepreneurs. So hmm. just that phrase right there, what does that kind of tickle inside your head? Oh, Tracy, you don't even know the cool things that, that entrepreneurs That would be the, the statement, right? You don't even know. You don't even know, man. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll, let me kind of do, let me do the, the two minute version of history of AI. So an okay. AI's history, actually can be done, done in 10 seconds is a history of overpromise and underdeliver, right? In the 90s, it was going to be, oh my gosh, there's going to be these sentient computers and they're going to take over the world. There was War Games, which was a huge movie in the 80s about- I remember that. The, the computers taking over the missiles and like, it's all over. And, and, and we've always had those stories and we have you know great sci-fi stuff to keep us on our toes about that. Where the reality of AI has become amazing in the last six years is that there's a type of machine learning that's called deep learning. And it's the idea of deep learning has actually been around for more than 25 years, but the implementation of it finally started to work about six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and what this means is that you can solve problems that, that we've never been able to do. And a lot of it's kind of happened around us and we have exposure to it, but actually I, I wrote down a list here. I wanted to, to go through with you really sure. quick. It would help us just Oh my gosh, there you go. That's, that's AI. Now I get it. So there's, there's four of them that I wanted to, to highlight that we've all seen in our lives that we may recognize each kind of uniquely as being really way better than the last version and changing our lives. But when you put them all together and you realize those are all the exact same technology, that's where I think we can get an aha moment. Okay. The first one is from my alma mater, one that I love, which is Alexa. And mine's now going to talk, so I'm going to unplug it while we're here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so is Alexa. And Alexa uses speech recognition. And Alexa's speech recognition is about five to ten times better, five to ten times better than the ones that were available seven years ago. That's how much of a huge leap in technology we have. The second one that we've all seen is image recognition. We've seen on Google Photos or Facebook will recognize something and then let you know, hey, this is your buddy. You want to tag them on your photo? Or right. now Facebook actually just automatically does it. doesn't even ask if it's okay. Just like, bam, here's pictures of your daughter. Right. And you're like, hello, Google Photos does that. We see that all the time. All the trademark stuff. Go ahead and try to post something about Mickey Mouse on your Facebook profile. You will you will learn very quickly how well the AI works. For right. Um. You've got uh, filters, right? So on Snapchat, you want to, you know, we could do it on Zoom too. Zoom has them. And you can make your face look funky. You can put eyeglasses on. You can have fireworks coming out of the left side of your head all day long, right? All of those things are done. It finds that point on your head mm -hmm. using AI. Um, and then the, the the last one is one that I'm, I'm really, really excited about, which is that your doctors are starting to use them uh, in, in uh speech recognition, speech synthesis, as well as image recognition of finding things like cancer. And uh, and those are all really ones that, that you may or may not have been exposed to in your daily lives, um, but those are all built. Every single one of those is built on, on deep learning. And every single one of those, even maybe more interesting, it was so disrupted that the companies that I just mentioned to you weren't even big companies when deep learning got invented, meaning that there were companies that were working on, you know, filters and putting stuff on your face. There sure. were companies that were working on tagging photos, but all of the companies that were doing that became disrupted because this new technology came in, deep learning came in and enabled the new players to replace the old players. And that's when, you know, it's a, I use the word revolution. Mm -hmm. and I mean, 
It's a technology revolution because the old people, the IBMs of the world, were not the companies that I mentioned that did these things. The um, the Flickr, which was the photo, for, for those of you who even remember, that was only like nine years ago. Flickr yeah. was a big deal. Flickr is not the photo tool to use. Google Photos is now. Uh, the voice recognition was a company called Dragon Naturally Speaking. That was yep. the primary one in 2012. Not there. Image recognition. Who's the best image recognition in 2012? The National Security Association, the NSA, or agency, department, National Security Agency. The NSA was the best image at image recognition. You know, newsflash, deep learning comes in, and now the best is Google. And wow. uh, and so those are those are huge transitions when you have the leader of these major industries and very important industries shift. Mm-hmm. Um, and so where that goes. So that's, that's how big it is for an entrepreneur. Now, the second thing I wanted to share with an entrepreneur is what, what can it do? Like, what are the opportunities for an entrepreneur? How does it work? The big idea for, for deep learning is that you put data in lots of data about something and then outcome. Oh my gosh. I almost forgot Tesla as the, the oh. self-driving car. Oh my gosh. Yes. I mean, it is. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. Like one of the largest market cap companies in the world that supplanted GM, Ford, Hyundai, uh, Toyota, uh, what, regardless of what, what country you're from, mm-hmm. they were able to plant all of them. That's how big of a, of a revolution this has been. And, um, and they're, they're all, uh, they're all technologies that are able to take lots and lots of data and turn it into something that can make what you can kind of consider mundane decisions for you. Do your busy work very, very quickly for you and very, very cheaply for you. And that's what we use it for at Deep Sentinel is we use it to review videos where, like you said, it's just your neighbor walking by, don't bring a guard under this. Right. But it's your neighbor sitting on your doorstep for a minute, bring a guard because you don't know why they're sitting there for a minute. That's right. a little bit weird. And so uh, what, what that means for an entrepreneur though is that when you look at almost any industry, it, I, I believe this revolution is so big that when you look at almost any industry, if you can change the way that industry works, whether it's construction, it's welding, it's selling bicycles. If you can change your interaction with your customer, your interaction with your suppliers by speech recognition, recognizing images, facial recognition, uh, or uh, doing gameplay scenario, playing out scenarios, Mm -hmm. stock trading is an example of that. If you can do any of those things, you can probably change the entire game for whatever your industry is that you're thinking about. That would be the way that I would kind of frame AI for, for entrepreneurs right now. Anything where you can do those things right now, you can plug in an AI basically off the shelf from Google or Amazon and beat any of the incumbents. Nice. Uh, you brought you, Everyone, you're going to want to rewind for about three minutes and make sure you re-listen to that. But I think there's really some gold in there and those that are clicking in their heads are going, oh, I've got an idea. I need to plug this in that, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I, I've got three things going on in my head right now, <laughs> but, but that, I, that's, that's what happens though. Right. It seems like every, mm. uh, maybe it's happening faster. Cause I, you know, obviously you can see the gray beard, right. I've, I've been around the block a couple of times and my gray uh, beard fell off. So oh, you there you it. go. <laughs> so it, it seems like periodically something or someone comes in and just stirs everything up. Right. Amazon obviously has, has done their stirring, the, the deep learning. You know, if we go back to the Microsofts and the Apples back mm-hmm. in the 80s, right? And Atari, and you know, you can just pause and you can go back through history in the past 50 years and just eat, there's each one of these points in time where like, oh my gosh, and it right behind it, everything else kind of changed with it. Like as soon as That's you right. had soon as PCs became available to the average Joe, then every small business started to get in them, which made them, uh, you know, uh, uh, be able to do a whole lot more things uh, slowly. And then it oper- it created opportunities for guys like me when I came out of the service. That was the first thing I did is I started doing uh, database programming for mm-hmm. preferred provider organizations because they were you were calling your preferred provider organization, say, okay, I need a doctor uh, that will do, I need a dermatologist in Norwalk, California, you know, and they had the one I went to, the first one I went to was doing it on like these four by five index cards or three by five index cards. They were going to, okay, Norwalk, and then they would just read off this index card. 
And I'm like, oh gosh, you, you could you could speed that. Jeez, just put that in a database. Just put that in a database. And the guy said, okay, come program it for me. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. Let's, let's go. And it's <laughs> these, those are the kind of changes that I think behind the scenes happen that just alter an industry entirely. And then tri- there's this trickle down effect. I think now, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's happening faster and faster because technology is moving. It seems to be ahead faster. AI, like you said, in the past six years, deep learning, it, it, it the time is starting to compress. Is, is that a fair statement? I think absolutely, right? The speed at which we have disruptive technologies changing industries that touch every human on the planet mm-hmm is increasing more rapidly, right? And I think that's really been accelerated by two things. It's been accelerated by mobile, which means everybody is connected. So I can deploy a new idea to the entire 7 billion person population of the world. And they may not all have it in their hand, right. but it will touch all their lives within 24 hours. And that's that's transformative, right? And some of my friends worked on the, the first laptops into India that were under $100. Some of my friends worked on the getting cell phones into India that are under uh, under $80 and things like that. But that mobility of compute, that, that would be the first one. And then the, the second one would be uh, the, the interconnectedness of the internet. That's what the, that all this is built on. And a lot of people don't realize that's only 20 years old. The yeah. internet as it exists today is only 25 years old, right? And and that's a baby, right? If you had a kid that was 25, you wouldn't let them run the whole world, right? Like, and, and, and everything now runs on that, right? I mean, we, we've realized that the, the internet is a more secure environment than the closed networks that we used to use. Mm-hmm. And that it's got greater reach and, 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 and greater scalability and all these different things that you can do. But that's only 25 years. So in 25 years, the internet and, and mobility have enabled, the pervasiveness of compute have enabled 10 other revolutions to happen on their back. That would be like social networking. Mm-hmm. That would be like e-commerce and distributed commerce. That would be distributed work, things like Uber. Um, which again, let's go back to the month before the pandemic was itself still revolutionary and was the headline mm-hmm. everywhere. Right. And, uh, and, and things like crypto, uh, things like distributed payments, all of those different things are themselves revolution that we're all enabled by this platform that, that changed everything around us. And there's a lot of money in, in the venture world that their only bet, they have one bet, and that's that software, this, this connected world of internet compute over uh, a connectivity is going to change everything. And mm. that and that's a huge idea. And, and even, you know, if I look at how big the AI transition is for me, that's built on top of that same platform. That's one of 20 of those revolutions that have been happening across all these industries. <laughs> That's crazy. My, uh, my my eyes are spinning a little bit here just thinking it's about it. It's the neat time to be alive, isn't it? No, it, I mean, it, it is really cool. I mean, because, you know, I was just, I mean, I was mid 20s when I came out of the service and, you know, the PCs were just starting to boom. And now, like you said, uh, 25 years ago, the internet finally come on. We were back in, you know, I can remember back in the day of bulletin board systems yeah. and modems. We're, forget AOL. We're talking about even before them, you know, yep. right? But uh, I mean, if you had a Nancy terminal, you were a step up from the kids on the ASCII terminals, right? Yes. Right. <laughs> and those that even know what those are are going, yeah, he's right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I'll just, I'll throw one more out there. X modem. If you're using X modem to move files across, right. Before FTP and all the others, mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it was a chore. Right. But it was, it was revolution. I remember the first time I connected to balloon net. I don't know if you remember balloon net, but it was a, yeah. a back end for email, right. It would connect different. You could send an email from one bulletin board system to another one. And it was all by itself. It's like, Oh, my mind is blown. And uh, that's only 25 years ago, right? And so the amount of stuff that's available to our kids growing up right now, the things that they assume are possible, it's just mind-blowingly so much bigger than what you and I assumed when we were growing up. Yeah, I think think folks like us, and maybe not you because you see so many things behind the scenes, but I think folks that are probably in our, our group have to unlearn more than they have to learn. Oh, dude, I, I find it. I, in fact, I was just thinking about this as you were saying it, like the, the place where I learn a lot about what technologies are doing well and taking off are from my kids, right? Like I learned about TikTok, which used to be called Musical.ly yeah. from my kids. And we, 
we found that platform together and I watch what my kids use both because I got to keep them under control because they're uh, one of them is a teenager and the other one's a little bit younger, but, but also because they see stuff way before you and I do way, way, way before. And, they, mm-hmm. they, and because they're ingesting that information with the assumptions of a connected world, with the assumptions of I get an iPhone when I turn five now, for God's sake. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> They have that filter that is already aimed at the future. They already know what the future could look like, whereas I still have to catch up to try to understand what they think the future might look like. And so I find watching kids to be amazing. I remember when the iPad came out, Mm -hmm. uh, my, my older daughter was four at the time, and I watched her able to interact with and manipulate an iPad. And I thought to myself, how mind-blowingly changing is that? We have figured out how to make compute at the level that is more powerful than the biggest supercomputer that was available when I was a kid, available to a four-year-old. And they can use, manipulate, and benefit, intentionally benefit from its use. Yeah. Being completely blown. Yeah, I think that's, for those generations that are ahead of us, like your kids and, and my kids, their thought process started way different early on, which means later on when they're our age, man, yeah, I can't even imagine. The, you might get jaded, right? And look at that and say, oh, you're so soft. Blah, 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 blah. But I think it, as an entrepreneur, the actual the, impart, and the important and smart thing to do is to look at them as your looking glass. They're your lens. Yeah. They're your crystal ball into the future. And yeah, maybe they may are, they may be a little more soft. And yeah, we didn't. They don't have to walk to school both ways, you know, uphill in the snow, the snow. <laughs> miles, right? Like okay, right? But but they see the world in the way that the future sees the world. Mm-hmm. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, I think you've got to see the world through their eyes, not through our old jaded curmudgeon. There it is. I think that's the magic statement right there. You've got to be able to see the world through their eyes. And, and I, cause that's one of the things I always tell folks is very important for them to see the world through their client, their prospect sides, their tribe, right? The people oh. they're, they're out there to serve. You, it's not your eyes anymore. You got people that are saying, I need this from you and damn it, you better give it to them. Otherwise they're going to find someone that will. Yeah. 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 It, it's easy to get mad at your customers, but uh, usually it's that friction when you're getting frustrated. That's where the jewels are. Yeah. That's where the magic is. Man, yeah, I could just sit here and riff with you for hours, Dave. This has been an amazing conversation, but I do want to be mindful of your time. Uh, two things. One, a Please. final thoughts you want to leave our audience with entrepreneurship, marketing. If you got an, if, what, what just kind of springs to your head? Man, I, I would say, you know, if you're, let, let's kind of look in the world from the perspective of, a, of an entrepreneur, a solopreneur, um, the, the thing that I would, again, kind of going back to that, that concept of knowing how to get past those really, really hard moments, I think at the same time, another thing that's really hard for entrepreneurs is to know when it's okay to move on. Right. An mm. entrepreneurial journey is also not a journey where you, you set your mind on something and that's the one thing that works out at the end. Right. Like let's, I mentioned Uber just a second ago, Travis Kalanick and I have been friends for uh, 23, 25 years, 26 years. Mm-hmm. Um, his first company was not a success. It was called Scour, scour.net. And it was eclipsed by Napster, which was the music sharing service. Mm-hmm. And he became a nobody. And then his next business was called uh, Red, it's called Red Spoosh or something like that. And it got acquired by Akamai for like, you know, uh, for, for real money, but not billions of dollars, sure. a couple million dollars. And he was actually kind of bummed about it. But that became the platform, that stepping stone, all of that learning became the platform on which he built Uber. And so also knowing that an entrepreneurial journey is is, is made up of a lot of really hard moments you've got to get around, mm. but that failures or successes of a lesser degree than what you thought they should be are also stepping stones in themselves. I find a lot of entrepreneurs hit failure on the thing that they, they, they've listened to these podcasts and they, they ground it through and then they fail. They've grounded through guns, did everything they could and they still failed and they just feel like they're depressed and their life lost meaning. But that's actually also another part of the entrepreneurial journey that if you can take that 
pick yourself up and maybe not pursue that exact same business. Maybe you do, Mm -hmm. but you pick yourself up, you put yourself back together and you go and you tackle the next opportunity. I mentioned another entrepreneur that a lot of people don't know his story is Sean Parker. Sean was the first president uh, and I mentioned Napster, actually, he was, he was the co-founder of Napster. He got fired from Napster in front of the world. He got fired from Napster on the steps of Congress, right? I mean, Napster was in, in uh, hearings. Uh, Sean Fanning, who was the founder of Napster, was in hearings at Congress and had to fire Sean Parker. And he was fired on the world stage. Mm. Bam! There you go. Sean Parker is a billionaire today. What did Sean Parker do next? And you're hoping I'm going to say he went and started Facebook, but he didn't. What Sean (laughs) Parker did next was Sean Parker went and started a company called Plaxo. And Plaxo was the predecessor to Facebook. And Mm -hmm. Sean built out all of the thinking and all of the learning, and he understood how social interactions result in what are what are called viral now called viral interactions of human beings and Mm -hmm. and they cascade and they're called network effects and he understood the math and the theory and the practical experiments you can do to build network effects and that was what he brought to facebook when he a lot of people watch the movie the social network but they don't realize that when sean said to do these things to, to change from the Facebook to facebook.com that you had to, to, to manipulate the way the users interact this way and this way and this way. It wasn't because he was some genius who just, just thought of this stuff. It was because he did the hard work and he failed. He got fired from Plaxo too, right? He got fired from Plaxo and it wasn't like he quit and he resigned and it was like, damn, he got his ass fired. But that was part of his entrepreneurial journey. And I was there with him. I was actually with him the day he got fired. And, and he had this uncanny ability, unparalleled in any other entrepreneur that I know, to take a failure of that scale, pick himself back up and go at it again. And that would be my message for entrepreneurs that, yes, while I'm telling you to like get through all these challenges, if you don't, that doesn't mean that you failed. If you don't, if, if for whatever circumstance it's out of your control, you make some mistake and your thing explodes. You are still an amazing human being. You look yourself in the eye in the morning. You give yourself the space to heal. And then you get yourself back together. And you realize that everything that led to that failure is pure, unadulterated gold and will be the foundation on which you build your next success. And you keep it together. Keep your head straight. Learn. Listen to the data. Learn from your mistakes. Learn from your failures. And you, if you have a heart of an entrepreneur, you will be successful. Oh, that's money right there. Huh? All right. Now, uh, Deep Sentinel, if anyone wants to learn more okay. about that, about you, where do we want to say, man, I, I just, I actually want to end it right there. But <laughs> I want to make sure people know. Where Deep to Sentinel, though. <laughs> I want to make sure people know about Deep Sentinel. If they want to learn more about it, where do we want to send them? I to? appreciate it. Yeah. So there's two things, two places you can go. The first one is you can come to my LinkedIn page. You can follow me. I publish uh, business tips from time to time and things like that. Uh, and then the second is uh, to go to Deep Sentinel's YouTube channel. We have a YouTube mm-hmm. channel and all those things I talked about, like, you have to see it to believe it. You will not believe how frequently and the, and the breadth of crimes that we stop to protect your business, to protect your home, to protect your family. We do it all. And uh, we do it for cannabis clubs, for, for uh, auto dealerships, for retailers, for jewelry stores, for mom and pop shops, for computer repair, for electricians, you name it. Those types of businesses are all getting hit by various types of crime. We're the only company that stops them all. And we do it all day long, every day. So go to our, our YouTube station, YouTube, uh, go to YouTube, search for Deep Sentinel, and you will find it. And, and it, that's no joke. You definitely got to check this out because I actually did go to the YouTube channel and I watched uh, quite a few of those. And uh, we'll make sure we get those links down in there so people can just click on through and check you out. David, man, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for, for your time this, this evening for me. <laughs> Tracy, I loved it. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me on here. Oh, my pleasure. All right, there you have it, my Dark Horse friends and family. David Selinger dropping some AI and entrepreneurial bombs on us. What resonated with you? Hmm? What do you think you need to go back and re-listen to? Well, let me care, share with you a couple of thoughts that kind of clicked with me. Thought number one, eat what you kill. 
Dave came out swinging right out of the gates with the advice of eating your own dog food. Or as he put it another way, eat what you kill. I mean, think about it. How many times have we heard some guru or advice giver out there sharing their insights and supposed gems only to learn later after pulling back that curtain that they weren't really following their own advice, were they? Mm -mm. Yeah, this happened to me not too long ago, actually. Uh, in my social media feeds, I read how one of the people I was following was sharing their thoughts on click funnels. And uh, whether you've heard about it or not is it really irrelevant. But they were sharing how they were not a fan of the product and spent a number of posts and even some time on their ep uh, on their podcast talking down the product. However, a mere, let's say, I think if I remember correctly, without exaggerating, it was four or six months later, they were using that very platform to market their brand and their product. Which, hey, you know what? Don't get me wrong. If you just changed your mind, okay, then maybe you should let your audience know. Tell them why you changed your position on the topic. But to just say one thing and then to go out and do the complete opposite, well, that smacks a bit of inconsistency and even, dare I say, lying to your audience. And trust me, ladies and gentlemen, they are out there paying attention and they will find out. Then, if when they do find out, they're going to start to question everything else you have told them. They're going to be going, hmm, what else has he not been forthcoming about? So, my friends, eat what you kill. Show your fans, your audience, your prospects that you're using the very advice you are giving them. Then, also, how they could use that in their life and their business. Take what you kill and feed your audience. Then, go one step further and teach them to kill what they need to eat. And they will love you for it. Thought number two, get back to your roots. Now, while sharing his story, David kind of breezed over something I think is very important to his next level of success, right? Now, mind you, right? He was very successful. He was seeing lots of success already, but he found himself flying all over the world doing, as he said, lots of sales. That wasn't really where his heart was at. So he stepped back to his roots of tech and started a whole new project with Deep Sentinel. Now, my point here is that you and I, someone outside, right, would have looked at him before Deep Sentinel and said, wow, look at him. He is a total success. And he was. And he is. But even still, it wasn't where he wanted to stay. So I say, as he said, he left that last company and he started yet another one. So let me ask you, how many times have you gotten yourself into a path and you stayed on it perhaps because you were seeing a little success or worse yet, be just because you're comfortable, right? Maybe that path was giving you or is giving you at least the basics of what you needed. Perhaps the basics financially, perhaps some level of fulfillment, but yet there was still something Something, something out there, right? Something else you needed. Now, if you're there now, or if you were feeling like you're about to be there, then stop. Take a breath, pause, and start looking around. Start looking inside and ask yourself, do you need to get back to some roots, right? Look, I'm not asking you to cull all your ties. Only you can answer if you're even able to do that. But at the same time, only you can answer, is this where I wanted to end up when I started? Hmm? And if the answer is no, or maybe there's just a little bit of doubt in the yes, then perhaps you need to go back to your roots so that you can right your ship and steer it back towards that more rewarding and far more fulfilling course you're hoping for. Thought number three, merging trends with ideas. David took 
two completely unrelated ideas combined him with some trends in crime that he saw and created an entirely new solution to an age-old problem that was in the midst of morphing. He noticed that the home-based crimes of break-ins were trending one way, while the outer perimeter crimes were quickly turning in a completely different direction. Combine this with a little new AI tech and older camera tech and BAM! You got an entirely new solution um, that was just born right then and there. You see, sometimes it's those that are watching what is happening in the market that are, they're able to jump in on an opportunity when it first starts to happen. You know, we, we've all heard the stories of someone seeing a stock starting to rise and they jump in on it and they were able to buy low and at the peak they sold high. Well, those are the, oh, I, I'm going to say this, those are the easy trends to spot uh, for those that are in that market, right? But we need to peel, you need to peel, I need to peel the onion of our market back a little deeper to spot those true gems. Then once you spot them, your single goal should be to find a solution for those problems, those gems, a way for you to help those in that trend, whether they are the victims of porch package theft or something completely different like tired of wearing the same old polo to the office every day, right? And, and everything in between, actually. So let's build on the polo for now, for example, right? Say you're noticing that there's an apparel trend towards, I don't know, camo, right? Uh, it could be plaid. I don't care, but let's go with camo, right? And you were smart enough to jump in and find a way to take that ever popular office casual polo and combine it with say some camo piecing you might stumble on a winner it could be a winner for outdoor enthusiasts it could be a winner for hunters it could be a winner for hikers for tree hugging well you get the idea keep your eyes on what is happening in your market and combine that with not just brand new ideas but perhaps combining old ideas with a new twist into a whole new opportunity. Thought number four, integrating their life and needs. David shared that one of the huge benefits of his service is that it integrates with local law enforcement. You see, when the camera alerts his off-site guards of suspicious activity, the guard can confirm that activity is in fact suspicious. They can attempt to correct and clear that activity and at the same time alert local law enforcement, here's the key, while that activity is happening. Not an alert of something that has already happened, uh, but that something that is currently happening and they can give the details of the suspect, their looks, their what they're doing, all right, and confirm that this is in fact active versus some of the standard alarms that are out there that could and do give off false positives. So that's a win-win, win-win for the homeowner, win-win for the, the local law enforcement. So the question becomes, how can you take your current product or your current service and integrate it into the life and the needs of your prospect? How can you make it even, how can you make it make even more sense because it aligns with something that they're already doing, something they're already using, or something they already have a need for. If you can integrate your product, your service into their worlds, not only as seamlessly as possible, but with the ad additional benefits at the same time, then look, you probably spend a whole lot less time selling than you would just showing them the improvements and the rewards that they would have as a result of that integration, turning it into a bit of a no-brainer, right? All right, so what inspiring ideas, tips, or thoughts resonated with you? Hmm? Whatever they were, take a minute, like right now, and write them down. That way you can get out there and put them into action, right? You write them down so you don't forget them, right? And then get out there, run your race, get your results, and let me hear about them. That's right. Email me at tracy at darkhorseschooling.com. Share the tips or ideas that you came away with, how you put them into action, and what results you gained from them. Heck, probably even bring you on the show and let you share your story.
win-win for both of us, right? <laughs> All right. Now, in our next episode, we're going to have Stacy Rasky. Now, Stacy is a best-selling author, speaker, podcast host, Iraqi war veteran, and like I said, badass biker chick. She's a boundaries expert, leadership mentor, authenticity alchemist, a success consultant, an influence activator, and legacy builder. This gal is on a mission to activate the highest power and potential in others, like you, by shattering that invisible ceiling so that they can really embody their truth and purpose while in still enjoying the ride. You're not going to want to miss this amazing lady. Now, I know you want to keep getting all these valuable tips and inspirational stories from the guests I'm lucky enough to bring on the show. So please make sure you go on down there, hit that subscribe button. Make sure while you're there, drop us a five-star rating. Maybe drop us a few kind words in the review. And of course, do not keep all this entrepreneurial G-O-L-D all to yourself. Share the podcast with other entrepreneurs and business owners that you know will get value from it. And with that, I'm going to leave you as I always do. Think successfully and take action. Thank you for listening to the Dark Horse Entrepreneur Podcast. And you know this. Thanks for tuning in. Check us out at www.darkhorseschooling.com. All right. My name is Tracy Brinkman.